Fire is the terrible symbol of the Spanish Inquisition. Fires were lighted every day to the glory of God and for the destruction by burning of the church's enemies. The Grand Inquisitor has become aware of an enemy. A stranger has moved among the crowds and performed a miracle. The crowds have pressed around him, awestruck, confused by hope. On the order of the Grand Inquisitor, the man has been arrested. Now it is night. The air is breathless with heat. The Cardinal comes to face his prisoner. You? Is it you? No, don't answer. Keep silence. Indeed, what could you say? No. You have no right to add anything to what you said before. Why have you come to make trouble for us? For oh, you have come to make trouble for us. You know you have. But do you know what will happen tomorrow? I don't know who you are, and I don't want to know whether it is indeed you or only a semblance. But tomorrow, tomorrow I shall condemn you and burn you as the worst of heretics. And that same crowd of people who today were kissing your feet, tomorrow at a single nod from me, will rush to pile up the faggots below your stake. Do you know that? Yes. Perhaps you do. Have you the right to make known to us a single one of the mysteries of that world from which you've come? No, you have no right. Nothing may be added to what was said before, for that would infringe on man's freedom of faith. And wasn't it you who kept repeating in those days, 1,500 years ago, I want to make you free? Oh, yes, it has cost us dear, this business. For 15 centuries, we have wrestled with that freedom of yours. Now our building is finished and secure in your name. You don't believe that we've made it secure? You gaze back at me so meekly. Not even a frown. Know this, then. Today, at this very moment, men are convinced, as never before, that they have perfect freedom, although they themselves brought their freedom to us and laid it humbly at our feet. 
But this was our doing. Was that the freedom you wanted? Was it? Man was created a rebel. Surely rebels can never be happy. Yet now, for the first time, it has become possible to think of people's happiness. You were warned, but you would not listen. You rejected the only way that which man could be given happiness. But fortunately, when you were leaving, you handed the job over to us. By your own word, you gave us the right either to bind or to loosen. And now, of course, you could not even think of taking away that right. So why have you come to make trouble for us? The great spirit, the brilliant and terrifying spirit of self-destruction and non-being spoke with you in the wilderness and we are told he tempted you. Surely if ever there was a true all-enveloping miracle performed on earth, it was performed on the day of those three temptations. For through those three questions, Three images are made manifest, which together contain all the insoluble contradictions of human nature throughout history. Now, 15 centuries later, we can see clearly that all those three questions so aptly foresaw has been borne out and nothing can be added and nothing taken away. Judge for yourself who was right, you? Or he who put the questions to you. Remember the first question. You want to go into the world, but you are going with empty hands, with only some promise of freedom, which men in their unruliness and simplicity cannot even put a meaning to, which they fear and dread, for nothing has ever been so unbearable to man as freedom. Now, if you were to take these stones lying about here in this wilderness and turn them into loaves of bread, mankind would follow you at once, grateful and obedient. You rejected that proposal. What kind of freedom is it you reasoned if obedience can be bought with loaves of bread? Man does not live by bread alone. That was your answer. Do you know that centuries will go by and mankind will declare through the mouth of its science that there is no sin, only hungry people. Feed them first and then ask virtue of them. That is the cry by which their science will destroy your temple. And for a thousand tormented years, they will try to feed themselves. No science of theirs will ever give them bread so long as they are free. And so, in the end, it will be to us they come and lay their freedom at our feet, crying, make us slaves, if you will, only feed us, feed us. They will realize that they can never have freedom and enough bread for everybody, that they are too vicious, too rebellious, too insignificant ever to be free. And we shall feed them, proclaiming falsely that it is done in your name. You promised them the bread of heaven, but if in the name of heavenly bread thousands and tens of thousands follow you, what are the millions and tens of thousands of millions who have not the strength to spurn earthly bread for the sake of the bread of heaven? The weak ones also are precious to us. They are imperfect and rebellious now, but in the end they will become obedient. They will marvel at us, think of us as gods because we agree to take upon ourselves in your name, the freedom that has become so fearful to them. And we shall not allow you to come to us again.
In that first question in the wilderness is contained the great secret of this human world. For man, once freed, has no more painfully urgent problem than to find something so utterly indisputable that all men will at once agree to bow down before it. For the sake of this community of devotion, men have destroyed each other with a sword. They have created their own gods and called out to one another, leave those gods of yours and come and bow down to ours or else death to you and your gods. And so it will be to the end of time. You knew you could not help knowing this fundamental secret of human nature. And yet you refused to accept what was offered you. The one absolute emblem of your power. This would have forced everybody to acknowledge you as the one indisputable object of worship. But in the name of freedom and heavenly bread, you rejected it. Now look what else you did, and still in the name of freedom. Instead of taking possession of man's freedom, you made it even greater. Instead of giving him something that would have set his conscience at rest, you offered him everything that is unusual, indefinite, and enigmatic. Everything that is beyond his strength. Just as if you didn't love him at all. You who came to give your life for him. You long for man to follow you freely, to decide for himself what is good and what is evil, with only your image before him for guidance. But although there is nothing so seductive to man as freedom of conscience, there is also nothing more agonizing. Surely it must have occurred to you that in the end he would reject your image and dispute your truth since you had left him so tormented and confused. It was you yourself who planted the seeds of the destruction of your own kingdom. Don't blame anyone else for it. Three, there are three forces, three unique forces able to conquer and hold captive forever the conscience of rebellious mankind. Authority, miracle, mystery. You rejected all three. When the wise and terrible spirit placed you on the pinnacle of the temple and said to you, if you are the son of God, cast yourself down, for it is said of him, the angels will catch him and bear him up and he will not fall. You listened and would not throw yourself down. Oh, of course, in that you acted proudly and magnificently like a god. With this weak and rebellious race of men, are they gods? How could you possibly suppose that man would be strong enough to reject a miracle? And at the times of his most fearful and basic spiritual questionings, Find himself left alone with nothing but a free decision of the heart. Certainly, you knew that your action would be preserved and the books would reach to the end of time. You hoped that man would remain with God, not needing miracles. But don't you know that the moment man rejects a miracle, he rejects God too? For it is not so much God that man seeks, but miracles. And since he is not able to exist without them, he will even create them for himself. Why, you would not even come down from the cross when they mocked at you, saying, come down if you're the son of God, and we'll believe in you. No, you long for man's freely given love. You refuse to enslave him with a miracle. You judged men too highly. Of course, they must always be captives, even though they were created rebels. You would have shown your love for them better if you had demanded less of them. Then their burden would have been lighter. Tell me how many you have been able to raise to your level 
in all these 1,500 years. It is true, of course, that at the present time, man is rebelling everywhere against our power and taking pride in his rebellion. But that is of no importance. It is the rebellion of school children against their teacher. The thrill of it will pass, and they will have to pay dearly for it. They will cry out in their despair. He who created us rebels must have meant to mock us. They will say this knowing it to be blasphemy, which human nature cannot bear, and their blasphemy will make them even more unhappy. So, after all that you suffered for the sake of their freedom, they have found for themselves nothing but unhappiness and confusion. Your great prophet tells how he saw all the faithful martyrs of the first resurrection, numbering 12,000 from each tribe. They had suffered as you suffered in the wilderness, feeding on roots and locusts. And of course, you can point to these children of freedom and the magnificent sacrifice they made in your name with proper pride. But they were only a few thousand, and they were like gods. But what of all the others, the millions of the weak? Surely you did not really come only to the chosen and for the chosen. If you did, and here is a mystery which we do not understand, and if it is a mystery, then we had the right to preach a mystery, telling the millions that it is not their freely given love which is important, but the mystery itself, which they must obey blindly, setting their consciences aside. This is what we have done. We corrected your great work. We founded it on authority, miracle, mystery. And the millions rejoiced that the terrible gift which had brought them so much torment was at last lifted from their hearts. Why have you come back now to trouble us? And why do you gaze at me so silently? with those pale eyes of yours. I don't want your love. Because I don't love you. What have I to hide from you? Do you think I don't know who I'm talking to? You already know what I have to tell you. I can read that in your eyes. Perhaps you really do want to hear it from my lips. Listen then. We are not with you, but with him. We have been with him and not with you for eight centuries, ever since we took from him what you had rejected. We took from him Rome and the sword of Caesar. Why did you reject that last gift? Had you accepted the counsel of the mighty spirit, you would have answered every need of man on earth, whom to worship, whom to entrust with his conscience, how all may be peacefully united in one single common anthill. By accepting the mantle of Caesar, you would have founded a world kingdom and blessed that world with the gift of tranquility. We accepted it for you. And in doing so, of course, rejected you and followed him. Oh, of course, there will still be centuries of man's unruliness. The work is only beginning, but it has begun. And in the end, the beast will come crawling to us and wash our feet with his blood. And we shall sit astride the beast and raise the cup of victory. And on it will be written the one word, mystery. Then and only then will the kingdom of peace dawn for man. We shall convince him that he can only become free when he has given up his freedom and submitted to us. Well, shall we be telling the truth or shall we be lying?
Men will see that we are right. They will remember into what a labyrinth of bewilderment and confusion they were brought by freedom and science. They will find shelter beneath our wings, huddled up together like baby chicks under a mother bird. We shall make them work, but they will have their hours of leisure too. And of course we shall allow them to sin, telling them that if it is done with our permission, every sin will be redeemed, for we shall take their punishments upon ourselves. They will bring us the most agonizing secrets of their consciences, and they will accept our solutions with joy, going quietly to meet their deaths, those millions of happy children snuffed out quietly in your name. And beyond the grave, they will find nothing. But while they are alive, we shall keep that secret from them for the sake of their happiness here on earth and lure them with an eternal reward in heaven. For if there were anything in the next world, it certainly wouldn't be for them. It is prophesied that you will come again with your elect and that you will conquer. We shall say that your elect saved only themselves, whilst we saved everybody. And we who took their sins upon us will stand up before you and say, judge us if you can and if you dare. Know that I am not afraid of you. I too was once in the wilderness. I too fed on roots and locusts. I too blessed that freedom with which you had blessed mankind. I too prepared myself to be numbered among your elect. But I came to myself in time. I would serve madness no longer. I came back to join those who corrected your great work. I left the proud returned to the humble. What I have told you will happen. Our kingdom will be built and in your name. And tomorrow I tell you again that obedient crowd that a nod from me will rush to pile up the faggots below the stake at which I shall burn you. And if ever anyone deserved our fires, it is you. Tomorrow I shall burn you. Don't come to us anymore. Don't come at all. Never.